This week in IT, discover the future of Windows and Microsoft Teams in our latest tech roundup. From the many enhancements in Windows 11 23H2, including a modernized file explorer and a more secure password free login experience. There's a big change coming to the Teams client next year, and we're going to look at the Teams Meet app, which offers a meeting management experience plus multi-language communication with live translations. So stay tuned for that and much more. Welcome to This Week in IT, where I talk about all the latest Windows and Microsoft 365 news. But before I get started, I've got a quick favor to ask you. 70% of all the people that watched last week's video weren't subscribed to the channel. Now we're at about 1,270 subscribers as the video goes live today, and I'd really love to push that up to 1,300. So if you'd like to help us reach our target and see these news updates every week, then please subscribe to the channel and don't forget to hit the bell notification to make sure you don't miss out on the latest uploads. Let's get started with Windows 11 23H2. So October 31st, Microsoft announced the general availability of this update. Now, I don't want to cover too much about the complete mess that Microsoft made of it. So basically, this update includes everything that Microsoft released in preview form, I think, at the end of September. And then again, in like just a few days, I think, before the announcement about 23H2, another preview of Moment 4. And that contained a whole load of fit and finish and some new features features in Windows 11 and actually it was a huge update and then came 23 H2, which contains, as I understand, a few bits and pieces that were not in Moment 4. But essentially what you're getting is 23H2, which also wraps up everything that you found in Moment 4. Now, what people are being offered on their machines is a bit odd. Some devices that I tried to update got this kind of cumulative preview of Moment 4 after the announcement of 23H2, so I couldn't understand why that was the case. Another device I tried to update was offered an actual non-preview version of 23H2. So it seems to be a little bit of a hit and miss thing, but it's not going to matter for most people. Of course, enterprises don't care anywhere at this stage. It's probably too early for them to be rolling this out to their users. So they will, of course, choose when to install this through whatever update mechanism they're using. And home users they will just get it when they get it. I expect it'll just be more widely pushed out in the middle of November for Patch Tuesday. But if you want to hit check for updates in Windows Update, then in principle, you should be offered 23H2 in its final form right now. There are a whole load of updates that, of course, that I could talk about. There are way too many to cover in this video. We'd be here all day, basically. I will put some links into the show notes that list all of the things that you're going to get with these updates. But I just want to cover the things that have stuck out as important to me. And I guess the best place to start is with File Explorer. Now, I guess that, you know, probably a lot of you might think, well, is this really important? So many people are working in the browser, in the cloud. Well, I think it is really important for people I don't know, like me, maybe like you as well, that are doing creative work with video files. We still have to do all of that stuff or a lot of that stuff locally. And, you know, I use File Explorer and I use the OneDrive sync for File Explorer. So I'm using it every day. Now, one of the things that we got in one of the moments was it last year, I think, was the ability to create tabs in File Explorer. But what you couldn't do was tear those tabs out and make two windows. Let's say you had two tabs and you just wanted to tear one of the tabs out, make it a separate window. You couldn't do that. Of course, you can do that with Edge and Chrome. And Microsoft have added that feature. Not only can you tear a tab out, but you can also put a tab back in and you know make a collection of tabs tabs that way if you like. So I think that's an important usability feature here because it just works the same way now as browser tabs work. If you're either signed into Windows with an Entra ID account 
or you have added an Entra ID account to a local sign-in, then you get a carousel in File Explorer now of recommended files across the top. Now, I have a couple of different Entra ID accounts added to Windows, and I see files from both of those different tenants in this carousel, it seems to me. So that's great as well how this works. There's a new gallery view. Now, this is very welcome. Of course, it only shows things that are either in your OneDrive or locally in your pictures folder. But essentially, it allows you to scroll down a timeline of dates so that you can quickly jump to a particular time period to find photos more easily. Now, a big change coming here, I think, for enterprises, and I think this is important for enterprises for a security reason. So Microsoft is adding support for various RAR formats, so compression formats that have never been natively supported in Windows before. So if you wanted to extract one of these files or decompress, if you like, you would have had to have installed a specific application to do that, something like WinZip or 7-Zip or something like that. Now, that's an extra burden for IT departments because, of course, users are being sent these files from time to time. So not only do they have to manage getting that application potentially installed for the user if it's a managed device, it also introduces a security risk. Because if you're not using the built-in file explorer in Windows, then those applications bypass various security checks on files and it just opens up the device to potentially, of course, malicious software that might be hidden in those compressed archives. So I'm glad to see this happening from a usability point of view, from a management point of view and from a security standpoint as well. Okay, so those are the main things with File Explorer. There's a whole load of other things. It's based on WinUI. There are improvements to search, la la la. I can't cover all of it, uh, but do check out the links in the show notes. The next thing that I want to talk about is passkeys. Now, this might be a bit confusing because passkeys and how Windows Hello has worked in the past, very similar. But I'll try and summarize it in at least my understanding. So Windows Hello, basically, or Windows Hello for Business, allowed you to sign into Windows and Microsoft, you know, Azure or Entra ID supported applications using that technology in Windows, essentially. So you'd have to use some kind of biometric gesture or a pin instead of a password. Now, passkeys is really different in the sense that it's not just a Windows Microsoft centric technology, but something that's supported by standards. So Google is supporting this, so is Apple. I'm not sure how far along they are in their story with this at this stage, but Windows 11 23H2 supports passkeys. So now you can log into Gmail, to Google Workspace, for instance, with a passkey. It's really simple to set up. The only issue that I have with it at the moment, of course, is that there are just not many sites that support it. Now, I think that will change going forwards. You know, I think, I don't know whether Apple and Google are planning to support this on mobile, but I think that's gonna be the key to getting wider support. So I'm not sure what the story is there yet, but anyway, Microsoft making a really good start with this in Windows 11, so do go and check that out. There is a newly designed store, it's faster, and it has an AI hub. Now, I don't use the store very much, I know there are people that do, but anyway, go and check that out. If you're in the States or a few other regions, you also get a co-pilot for Windows, and of course, the press making a big deal about you know, anything related to co-pilot at this stage, but I don't think that you're really missing out if you don't have access to it at the moment. I'm in Europe, so I haven't seen it. I think it's basically being being enterprise chat wrapped up in a window with a few extra features that allows it to kind of make some configuration changes for Windows. You can say something like, you know, change Windows to dark mode and it will basically do it for you. So I don't think it offers a huge amount at this stage, but it's interesting to see Microsoft starting to build this AI stuff directly into Windows 11, especially before the release of Windows 12, which is likely to be very 
AI centric. A couple of other things, there are some now enhanced login features in Windows Firewall and some integration with Windows Defender application control that allows you to not have to specify an absolute path to an application as I understood. So those are going to be welcome changes uh, for administrators. There's a new volume mixer so you can mix the volume separately for uh, individual applications. I think that was a regression from Windows 10. And while I'm on the subject of regressions from Windows 10, I know some people are going to be very pleased now that you can separate icons on the taskbar so that you see each application instance in a separate label on the taskbar. So imagine you've got, I don't know, two instances of Edge open, rather than seeing them as one label, you will see them separately now as two labels on the taskbar if you choose to enable that feature. And that's something that you could do in Windows 10. So I'm just scratching the surface with the changes. They're the ones that I think are probably the most important. And I think, you know, Windows 11 is obviously <laughs> getting to the stage now where it ought to be, you know, relatively, you know, mature. I don't think they're going to add a huge amount to Windows 11 after this update, because obviously Windows 12 is likely to appear at some point next year. That doesn't mean to say they won't add features. Of course, they're still adding bits and pieces to Windows 10, because these operating systems are going to be supported, especially in the enterprise. And, you know, even Microsoft understands that these things just have to exist you know, for many years to come. So, but anyway, it's great to see these things happening. So let me know what you think about the way Microsoft has handled the rollout of 23H2. And do you think these features are enough? Has Microsoft done enough work on Windows 11 to make it worthy of your attention and use at this stage? I'd love to know what you think below. So put this date in your diary, the 31st of March, 2024, Microsoft will be automatically upgrading users to the new Teams app if they haven't already chosen to move over to it. So Microsoft is saying that the legacy Teams app will be retired on that date. Now they're not saying, at least as far as I've read, that it's not going to be available anymore. I'm not sure that that's going to be the case, but that automatic upgrade is going to happen. So you need to make sure that users are ready and that you are ready. Of course, this is the new Teams client 2.0 that's based on React, I, th I think, and uh, Edge WebView 2. So it's faster, it's more lightweight. This is where all the new features are going to be added. The Teams Meet app is now generally available. You have to kind of add this, it's there in Teams as an extra icon on that panel of apps that you see on the left hand side and really what this does is it just helps to give you a real great overview of all your meetings you kind of get a calendar view you get a summary of the meetings and we don't use um, Outlook for calendar or email in our tenants. So I've not really been able to see how well this works in principle. But I think, you know, it just giving you this view to help you kind of get a grip on all the information, all the meetings and things that are going on. I know this is a really hard, you know, because some people have huge amount of meetings to deal with information, you know, joining meetings, being prepared for that meeting and then trying to find out, you know, and remember what was said and what action points you have in a meeting. All of that stuff can be really hard to track. And this app is designed to make that easy. If you're a Teams premium user, you're also going to get the live translation feature in 30 different languages. Again, I'm not a Teams premium subscriber. I've not seen this in action myself. I wonder how well this works. Sometimes I think I need translation from English to English, let alone from English to any other language. But anyway, that's great to see and it should help, of course, make meetings uh, across these uh, situations where you have language barriers much easier and even possible, in fact. Now, with all the Windows news this week, it might be that you missed that Microsoft 365 Copilot is now generally available. So I think it was November 2nd it became available for E3 and E5 customers. So you have to have an enterprise level subscription with Microsoft to get it. It costs $30 a head. So of course, it's a little bit limited at this stage. I'm not sure whether Microsoft plans to expand the availability of Copilot to the you know other business plans that it has. But 
anyway, it'll be really cool to get some real feedback from a wider range of organizations about whether this really lives up to expectations because of course 30 bucks a head is a big ask so in my mind it has to deliver something pretty impressive but if you have one of those licenses then in principle you can go and add the Microsoft 365 Copilot feature if you're prepared to pay for it to your subscription now. I think it was last month or the month before that Microsoft added support for roaming signatures in Exchange Online. Now, Microsoft this month is saying they're adding a policy that's going to allow administrators to disable that roaming signature feature in Outlook on the web and the new Outlook for Windows. So, you know, while roaming signatures has probably been a long time coming to Exchange Online, I guess that not everybody wants or needs it. So you should be able to now disable that feature. And if you're a Windows 365 user, so that's the kind of cloud PC software as a service or desktop as a service, I guess I should say offering that Microsoft has for Windows, you are now able to get two different configurations that offer higher specs. So you get in two new configurations based on 16 virtual CPUs, both 64 gigabyte memory, but with two different disk configurations. You get 512 megabyte and one terabyte disks. Now, these are of course designed for applications that just need a whole lot more processing power to give more flexibility. Now, as part of this announcement, Microsoft said that coming at some point in the future will be options to add GPUs. So if you need to run something, I don't know, like Photoshop or uh, AutoCAD or something that really needs a lot of processing in the graphics department that is coming to Windows 365. They don't have any offerings with dedicated GPUs at the moment, but it's coming if that's something that you're likely to need. Thank you for watching. If you found the video useful, then I'd really appreciate it if you gave the video a like because it helps us to get this video pushed out to more people on YouTube. I'm going to leave you with another video on the screen that you might find interesting, and that's about Windows on ARM and how that connects to the new Snapdragon X Elite chip that Qualcomm announced last week. Now, hopefully it's going to enable Windows on ARM to compete with the M1, M2, and of course now the M3 Max. But that's it for me for this week. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.